And uh, Dr. Chapman, again, just such an honor. I'm so excited to pick your brain a little bit this morning, too. How are you? I'm doing well, and I'm glad to be with you. So that's uh, you're in Florida. I'm in North Carolina. But yep. you will be in east. Florida soon, though. <laughs> yes, starting February the 4th. I'll be there the entire week doing conferences on Saturday and uh, date nights in different cities uh, throughout the week. So I'm excited about that. So tell me about, uh, you've been doing these marriage conferences uh, for many years now, and I can, I'm can i just so excited to hear maybe even, you know, how you've seen God really work through uh, different relationships and stuff. That's got to be a pretty rewarding uh, part of this, I think, as well, the stories that you've been able to hear. But as here we are in 2023, I kind of want to start here with where your thought is on marriage and how marriage is looked at today. I feel like so much, you know, when you first started kind of on this path, at least from the book kind of side of things from the early 90s, our world was so different. We didn't have Internet. There wasn't social media. Yeah, I, I think, you know, relationships uh, always are affected by the culture that's around us. And, uh, you know, without technology, things were much simpler. But on the other hand, we do things with technology we could not do uh, years ago. Uh, for example, what we're doing now <laughs> and uh, all of that. But I think what's happened is uh, we've become almost obsessed with our cell phones. And I see married couples sitting at a dinner in the restaurant, and they've each got their phone out. And they're not sharing things with each other. They're answering their text messages. And I'm thinking, you're paying money to sit out here. <laughs> Why don't you talk to each other? <laughs> but, yeah, I think technology has had an impact in a negative way. The plus of that, however, is with military couples where they're half a world away mm -hmm. and they can FaceTime each other. Wow, that's positive. So I encourage couples, use technology in a positive way but don't become obsessed with it and let it draw you away from each other. Uh, you know, uh, marriage has to do with relationship. Relationship has to do with sharing our thoughts, our emotions, our opinions, our desires with each other, and processing life together. Uh, marriage is to be the most intimate of all human relationships. And when I say intimacy, that's not just physical intimacy. That's the intellectual, the emotional, the social intimacy. And when a couple has that kind of relationship and that kind of intimacy, marriage is what it was designed to be. And that is a deeply satisfying, encouraging uh, a relationship that helps us in everything else we face in life. One of the things uh, that I love that you also teach couples, and again, I shared before we got uh, started that uh, me and my husband are getting ready to celebrate 18 years. Um, but I know in these conferences, from what I can tell, you really focus on the languages and how you can make sure that that um, each side knows that they're loved and appreciated. And that looks different, I think, for, for every person. But then there's also this other side of conflict and how you um, deal with conflict that I think sometimes we're just it's hard. We maybe just kind of go after it of what our parents did or the other examples. Kind of touch on that as well. Yeah, I think uh, resolving conflicts is a necessary part of uh, marriage, a healthy marriage. And the reason I say that is because all of us have conflicts. We grew up in different settings. We have different ideas. We have different emotions. And uh, we're going to run into each other along the way. Uh, if, you're, if you're not married to a human, you know, maybe you wouldn't have conflicts, but all humans have conflicts. Conflicts are not a problem. It's when we face those conflicts with the idea that I've got to convince my spouse that my idea is right. And they've got to abandon their idea and come to my idea. And when you do that, you may win the argument, but they lost. It's no fun to live with a loser. So why would you want to create a loser? So, yeah, I have a whole session where we deal with communication. What advice do you have? Because I'd imagine you probably hear this a lot where you have um, one person in the relationship that's really wanting to make a change and a difference and improve things, and the other person just isn't there yet. Yeah, well, I think most of the time when we think of improving the marriage, by nature, we're, we're thinking in our mind about if they would change this, this, and this, and this, 
we'd have a better marriage. And so most people start at the wrong place. <laughs> start by asking, what could I do that might make our marriage better? And, and ask that of your spouse. You want you want to know what's going on in their mind and their heart. You just say, honey, you know, I've been thinking I really would like to, our marriage to keep growing. So what could I do that would make our marriage better? Well, what do you think? They'll give you. And hopefully they'll just give you one or two, not all 10, you know. <laughs> and then you say, well, you know, I'm going to try to work on that, you know. And so you start working on it. And I can almost guarantee you, you ask that question a couple of times, they will return the question. And they will say to you, well, honey, uh, let me ask you that question. What what could I do that would make our marriage better? And then you share. And just share one or two. Don't share a whole lot. <laughs> but you see what I'm saying? If we start at the right place with ourselves and finding out what we could do, we set a climate in which the other person is likely to join us in that approach. One of my greatest um, joys right now is hearing people's testimonies and, and really kind of finding out what it was that they look back on their life and they say, you know, look what God did or, you know, this is why I know, you know, God is real. Do you have moments in this journey, again, several decades in now of helping other uh, marriages and, and really helping people on this journey where you say, man, look what God has done and it's just helped increase your faith any? Yeah, actually, my own marriage was greatly changed radically because my wife and I had a lot of struggles in the early days of our marriage. Maybe that's why God has led me to spend my life helping people have the kind of marriage they wanted to have when they got married. But I remember the day when I said to God, I don't I don't know what to do. I mean, we're just not getting along. And I was in seminary. I was studying to be a pastor. And I was pretty miserable in my marriage. And I'm thinking, I, I can't get up and preach to people and, and, and be miserable like this. Mm-hmm. And I said to God, I don't know what else to do. And when I said that, there came to my mind a visual image of Jesus on his knees washing the feet of his disciples. And I really heard God say to me, that's the problem in your marriage. You don't have the attitude of Christ toward your wife. Mm-hmm. It hit me like a ton of bricks because I remember what Jesus said when he stood up. Having washed their feet, he said, you call me teacher and Lord, and you're right. But in my kingdom, the leader serves. And I knew that was not my attitude. You know, my attitude was, woman, if you'll listen to me, we'll have a good marriage. (laughs) She wasn't listening, and I was blaming her. And I said, Lord, forgive me. With all my study in theology, I've missed the whole point. And I said, please give me the attitude of Christ toward my wife. Mm-hmm. In retrospect, it's the greatest prayer I ever prayed about my marriage because God changed my heart. And I started asking her questions like I was talking about. He goes, Honey, what could I do to help you? Said, How could I make your life easier? How could I be a better husband? And she started answering me. And I started doing those things. And three months later, she was asking me those kind of questions. And when you get people, you know, both reaching out to serve each other, you're going to have the kind of marriage you wanted to have, a loving, supportive, caring marriage. So, uh, yeah, I, I think I think our relationship with God and having the attitude of Christ uh, tremendously infects, affects our marriage. Oh, I love that. I, I have to ask from a mom. I also have a, a mom perspective. I have uh, three young ones. I have two in elementary school and then a, a bonus baby, as we like to call a three-year-old. Uh, but... You know, it's interesting along this journey, then you really also found that that um, it's very useful to understand your kids love language as well. Touch on that if you yeah. can. Yeah, I think. Well, first of all, I think we have to recognize that almost everyone agrees that one of our deepest emotional needs as children and as adults is to feel loved by the significant people in your life. And for a child, no one is more significant than their parents. So to parents. The question is not, do you love your children? We love our children by nature. The question is, do your children feel loved? I remember the 13-year-old said in my office, he had run away from home, and he ended up in my office. And he said to me, my parents don't love me. They love my brother, but they don't love me. I knew his parents. 
I knew they loved him. The problem was they had never discovered his primary love language and they weren't speaking it. So he, they were loving him, but not in a way that was meaningful to him. And of course, the basic concept of the five love languages is that out of those five, each of us has a primary language. And if you don't speak the primary language, they won't feel loved, even though you're loving them in other ways. So it's important to discover a child's primary love language. And there's a couple of ways you can do that. One is observe their behavior. How do they respond to you? you know, my son, for example, when he was four years old, I came home from work. He had run to the door, grabbed my legs and climbed on me. He's touching me because he wanted to be touched. That was his language. My daughter never did that. At four years of age, she would say, Daddy, come to my room. I want to show you something. She wanted quality time. She wanted my undivided attention. So discovering their language by observing their behavior. And also, what do they request of you most often? For example, my daughter in, in high school would say, Dad, her, her favorite request was, Dad, can we take a walk after dinner? She wanted the two of us just to be together, sharing quality time. My son would never walk with me. He said, walking's dumb. You're not going anywhere. If you're going somewhere, drive. <laughs> what he wanted to do was well, he, he'd say, Dad, can we go play basketball? And the way we played basketball in the backyard, it was physical touch, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, discovering the child's primary love language. And uh, well, the other thing is what do they complain about most often? A mother said to me the other day, she said, Gary, my six-year-old said to me, we don't ever go to the park anymore since the baby came. See, he <laughs> used to have his mother's full attention at the park, just the two of them, but now the baby's here. He's complaining. He's not getting his quality time. So you put those three things together, you can figure a child's primary language. Yeah. But, but don't hear me saying that you only speak their primary language. You give heavy doses of the primary, but you sprinkle in the other four languages because we want that child to learn how to receive love and later give love in all five languages. That's the healthiest adult. But the good news is this. You can learn to speak these languages as an adult, even if you didn't receive them as a child. So we can be good parents. We can meet the need of our children for love. And we can discover and speak our spouse's primary language and also sprinkle in the other four for extra credit. <laughs> and you're going to have a loving family. Well, that's what I wanted to, to end on here is uh, it was, you know, interesting. Just my pastor a couple weeks ago, we had one of the most powerful messages and we were talking about how we are such a lonely culture right now, even as connected as we are friendships, I think, you know, marriages. I mean, it's just, especially I think post, you know, COVID and post the pandemic, it changed our behavior. But what is your message of hope and getting back to connecting and having real meaningful relationship? And I think it's so important. And because this is where real life's real meaning is found. It's found in relationships. First of all, with God, nothing more important than one's relationship with God, because that affects everything else. But the other then is relationship between the husband and wife and the parent child. I mean, this is the central focus of family. And it means we've got to make time, make time to talk to each other because the culture is so fast and so busy. If we don't make time, we can go weeks without doing anything except talking logistics. Who's going to pick up the baby today? Who's going to go by school? Who's going to get the groceries? We, we discuss logistics. So I, I encourage couples to have a sit down and listen time every single day. It can be 15 minutes. It can be 30 minutes. But you just sit down and say, okay, what was the high point of your day? What was the low point of your day? What have you been thinking about today? You know, just sharing with each other life and how, how you're processing life with each other. Same principle of having a daily sit down and listen time to God. You know, God, I'm reading this chapter. I want to hear what you have to say to me today. You have that sit down time with God. You'll probably talk to God all day long about other things. Mm -hmm. And the same thing is true. If a couple can have a sit down time listening to each other, they'll probably have good communication in their marriage. 
Amen. I love it. Well, of course, where would you send people? I know you're going to be in Florida for quite, you know a little bit doing these marriage conferences, but you're all over the place nationally as well, where people can uh, just soak in all this great advice and the experience that you've had working with couples uh, over the years. Where would you send them? If they go to the website, fivelovelanguages.com, the number five, fivelovelanguages.com, and check on events. They can see not only the Florida events, but they can see other places, perhaps, where I'm going to be in the future. Awesome. Well, again, thank you so much for your time. I really, really appreciate it. It's uh, such an honor. You keep doing uh, what you're doing because you are helping marriages uh, and, and relationships, really, of all shapes and sizes. Uh, so you keep you keep it up, okay? Well, thank you, Carly. And you keep up your work, all right? All right. Sounds good. <laughs> thank you, doctor. <laughs>